Hey everyone, Bruce Eckfeld here at Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications so we can let you know when the next video is posted. You can also check us out at Eckfeld.com for more great content. With that, let's go check out the video. You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. And our guest today is Jennifer Chang, and she is author of The Startup's Guide to Customer Success. And we're going to talk to her a little bit about what it means to have a successful customer strategy and what it means to kind of be customer-centric in your mindset as you develop your business. And I'm excited about this. I think this is a, it's a great topic uh, for anyone who is a service-based company. So let's get into it. With that, Jennifer, welcome to the program. Thank you. Great to be here. So uh, let, let's get a little bit more information about you, your background, and then we can talk about the book. So uh, professional background, where, where did you start and how did you get into this, uh, this facet of the profession? Yeah, so I started kind of in the business world. Customer success, being customer centric has always been something I've been interested in and kind of being heavy on communication, making sure everyone's okay, um, has something has been something that I've always focused on throughout my career, whether that's internships or anything like that. So I started out in the business sense and realized that, hey, like I'm at a startup and it's here in San Francisco and there's a lot of talk about being customer centric, right? Yeah, a lot yeah. of CEOs, you know, we're so customer centric, we care about the customer, but I realized that, you know, even talking to my friends, like, what does that actually mean? And that's yeah. when I started getting the customer success, being understanding like, okay, yes, you can say you're customer centric, but what actions are you taking to really, really show that? To really tell your customers that, hey, I'm listening. Hey, I'm actually reacting to what you're saying. And, you know, there's been so many studies, like even in the early 2010s, over 85% of people have said that, you know, they actually choose companies based on the customer experience. So there's this huge shift in focus from the customer of like a high touch or like white glove experiences they want to be treated well and then choose companies based on that so that really interests me um kind of going into profession being like whoa okay so how what does this mean for my start right we were you know we were at the time we were 10 people and one dog you know um you know the dog was security if you ever wondered yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when i really think, thought of like okay like how do we bring this company to the next level there's a lot of people in this space how do we take this to the next level right and that's kind of where I started going into customer success. Yeah. As I went into customer success, I realized, you know, there's a ton of resources out there. And I got completely overwhelmed because just as there's so many different types of companies out there, yeah. which means that yeah. there's a lot of different types of customer centric models out there. Yeah. So for example, what how to be customer centric in a B2B sense, you know, if I'm talking to a company yeah. versus if I'm talking to the end user, it's going to be very, very different. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I work at a company. Yeah, exactly. So I work at a company where we work with parents. We're an education company uh -huh. and everyone cares about the child's education and rightly so. What this means is that we need to be extra. We need to be very, very customer centric to make sure that the parent and the student feel like we're there for them along the whole journey. Yeah. Right. The whole academic journey, especially since, you know, you mess up one thing in education and then there's like snowball effects and things yeah. like that. Yeah. But yeah, that's kind of how I started my journey and realized like, okay, yes, there's so many resources out there. And I realized that a lot of them would be B2B and I'm yeah. in B2C. Yeah. So what does that mean? And and especially since I'm a startup, I don't have that many I don't have that many resources. I don't have like a fifty thousand budget where I can spend on technology that will make my life super easy and quick. Uh, yeah. so what does that actually mean? That's why, you know, I started learning, started reading, started talking to people and I've been kind of putting that all into a book. And that's what I recently published. <laughs> Good. So so let's talk about let's talk about customer, because I think that's sure. I think that seemingly is easy, but uh, I certainly have found in, in my own kind of personal startup experience and in my kind of coaching and advising experience that defining that can actually be harder than, than it originally seems. Um, <laughs> and particularly, like you mentioned the B2B, and actually even in your situation, I mean, you have multiple customers or multiple stakeholders or multiple people that you're trying to satisfy for different levels. You know, how... 
how do you kind of start with that question of, or how do you begin to answer that question of who is your customer? Or what's your strategy around that? Definitely. And I think that's such an important question as well. You don't know who your customer is. You don't know how to center around your strategy, your product strategy, your customer success strategy. So really figuring that out is super, super important. And I recommend, you know, first you just kind of go out there and see, you know, when you're starting, you kind of go for part product market fit and then you kind of like ask around, see who gravitates naturally. But as you're developing that persona, as you're learning about your user, what I think people usually forget about is understanding what I call user complexity. So understanding the emotion behind every single, like what, like what emotion are people having when they're interacting with your product, whether that is from the very beginning. So, Hey, how searching for, I don't know, for example, I'm searching for a product that can solve my commuter needs, right? What type of mindset uh, do I have going into this? What type of emotions are, am I experiencing? Am I experiencing anxiety and not getting to work on time? Am I, or am I being trying to be opportunistic? Like that's really important for the company to understand, especially marketing, to understand like, okay, how do I make sure that I'm meeting the customer where they're at? User complexity is also really important when it comes to the product. So, or even with the support side of, okay, so if someone is having an issue with your product, where are they coming from? Are they coming from a place of desperation? Are they coming from a place of, you know, this is kind of annoying, but I'll figure it out later. And what does that mean? And what pressures do they have outside of them? So whether that is for us, it's academics. So that could be their teacher pressure, pressure to go to college, things like that. And how we meet them there so that so that we can cater to their needs and to their actual pain points that may not be the pain points that they're saying to us. So I think that's, I kind of went a little bit one step further into better, better understanding your user, yeah. but I think that's something that we need to, as you know, CEOs and as leadership, we need to always keep in mind. Yeah. No, well, I like that idea of really understanding the different kind of stakeholders of the people that you're trying to service and then, and then what their concerns are. And I like the whole idea of kind of the emotional needs or the emotional kind of situation or context they're in. I think it's very easy for us, particularly as business people, very kind of analytical at times to, to look at the task that we're trying to get done and not not appreciate the sort of confounding emotional factors that are going into the drive for that task, the desire to do that task or the complexity of that task and the ability to kind of deal with the task, particularly a complex task, if, if there are other kind of pressures or, or, you know, things going on for that person as they're going through it. And I think fa failing, yeah. failing to get that can lead to problems or at least lead to a lack of success on that. Yeah. And definitely it could go also, also go the other way. So if my user, you know, is kind of like kind of blase and like, oh yeah, I don't really care about this. <laughs> like we also need to know that too, right? So because yeah. maybe we're spending too many resources on this, right? So it's like, it's, it's the whole spectrum. <laughs> yeah. Or, or uh, that we assume they're going to they're going to have more motivation or persistence on this task than they actually will, you know. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. So so really, kind of developing that emotional map or that motion model for how they're engaged in it is 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 interesting. In terms of kind of defining customer, you know, I, I guess one thing that you know we do a lot with kind of on the business strategy side is identify a core customer and and describe them in different ways what are the some of the things when you when you yeah. begin to kind of model a customer or, or define a customer what are the things that you're looking to sort of define or to build characteristics around definitely so i think you want to understand you know not only where they are coming from emotionally, but what are their pain points that they want to solve, right? Yeah. And who are they, right? How do they interact with technology, especially in the technology world? Or it's really important to understand like what devices do they have? How experienced are they with technology? So for example, if they barely know how to write an email, you know, maybe you shouldn't tell them how to do messaging, right? <laughs> it's like meeting them where they're at. So kind of understanding what their technical capabilities are. Um, understanding their team size is also really important. So are you dealing with one person who has all the, has uh, a better idea of what's going on? Yeah. Or are you dealing with one person who you're one of very, one of many vendors, right? And you are, they deal with thousands and thousands of end users and they don't have a lot of time for you, right? Because you're going to approach these two people very differently. Yeah. And then the last thing that you want to also kind of note is, if they have any previous experience with products like yours, right? So have they on board, have they worked with vendors before? Have they worked with third parties? Have they worked with, for example, in our service, 
um, because we kind of do 24-7 homework help um, on demand, it's, have they ever done tutoring before? Do they know what kind of one-to-one tutoring looks like for them? And kind of always meeting them where they're at. Yeah, actually, it's funny. It's a funny one for me. I'd, one of the questions, first questions I ask a prospect when they, you know, I get a referral or, or someone comes in through my website or something and they're interested in hiring a business coach. Yeah. The first thing I say is, have you ever used a coach before? Um, exactly. Because yeah. it, it, it immediately, <laughs> immediately gives me, you know, a basis to be able to understand, okay, well, what worked with that? What didn't work with that? What did you like? How did that coach work? You know, even if it wasn't business coach, I might, I might talk about like an athletic coach or a personal yeah. trainer or anywhere where they've had somebody helping them, you know, advise them on a, on a process, you know, setting goals, achieving those goals, working through obstacles, dealing with mindset. You know, if they've had some basis of experience, which we can use to triangulate, well, am I right? Am I a, a good fit for them is, is really powerful. So I can see this whole, this whole thing of understanding the context Have they used anyone, any service uh, like, like yours before is, is a good way to kind of triangulate that. Definitely. It goes throughout the whole customer journey as well. It's not only being able to sell to that person differently, but it's how do you care to that person once they're in the door, right? Yeah. And the common example that one of my good mentors, Jamie Jeff, shared with me was, you know, when you go into a car dealership, right? If uh-huh. you have never bought a car, the very first time you're going to buy a car, you're going to, you know, read the whole manual, figure out how everything <laughs> is. And then I throw them out questions, now, right? <laughs> Yeah. And then literally, like, if it's like your fifth car, you're just like, yeah, give me the keys. I'm going. You know? like, <laughs> well, I don't, don't have my keys me. anymore. It's just like, give me the fob. I'll just put the fob in my pocket and I drive away. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it's like, how do you, how do you cater to them? Like not only sell, but also be like, okay, how, like, what are the next steps after you sold them? Right. So it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, the car one is a good example because I think the people that are really doing, you know, really fascinating kind of services and are, are, are innovating in this space are even just rethinking that whole thing. So, you know, why go to the dealership? You know, you can, you know, I'll bring yeah. the car to you. You can try it for a day. And if you like it, you know, we'll just, we'll charge you. you know, it's like, you know, I think once you become kind of customer centric or customer focused around some of these things, you are able to rethink some assumptions or some standard way of doing things that can really innovate in an industry. I mean, can really kind of change the way that, um, you know, that the game is played. Um, let, actually, let's take a step back and just talk about this whole idea of customer journey because I think that is, uh, I think that's somewhat of a, a, a customer a customer experience term that not everyone may get. When we talk about customer journey, what are we referring to and why is it important to understand that or to kind of map that out? Yeah. So for a CEO, for you know leadership team, the customer journey starts the moment the customer learns about your company, right? And ends the moment they leave. And you want to make sure that every step of the journey is not one, seamless so you know there's no super chunky like okay in marketing you told me that this this product <laughs> yeah. could do x but then when you when i actually use it it does y like that's not a seamless customer journey right yeah. so from that sense is understanding you know how is the customer feeling along the whole way are they having a good experience is the handoff between departments very seamless and then within each team you kind of go to the next level down of What's the nitty gritty? Like, how are people feeling on every single step of the way? What are their pain points? You know, is this button too green and that, that therefore they don't see it, or is it, or is it they? Some people are colorblind, can't see green. I don't know. I'm making these up as I go, but understanding like how the customer is interacting with the product and interacting with the team, so whether it's support, implementation, onboarding, whatever, mm-hmm. throughout that journey, like what does that look like? And being super detailed in this way forces everyone to think about the customer and forces everyone to then kind of put their themselves in that shoe in their shoes and really innovate and you kind of going back to what you were saying before innovating be, taking that next step and pushing the envelope uh, and building your company really yeah uh, there's um I, I came out of the lean agile world uh, more on the kind of tech and software side but I, I think one of the things that i've i've kind of brought over to the general business strategy and business consulting world is the whole idea of value maps um, or value stream mapping and, and really kind of helping, you know, a business think through what's every step that, you know, a customer goes through with you and, you know, where where is the value add and where is waste and how can you redesign your service process uh, around increasing value, increasing the value delivered from the customer's point of view and decreasing the amount of waste, whether it's, you know, time or movement or energy or rework or, you know, all the, all the different types of muda when we, you know, in, in Japanese uh, management terms. But I think it's that same, that it's a very similar idea, at least, is, you know, having a very clear customer centric view of where is value being created for them and how do we how do we make sure that we add add as much as possible and reduce the things that are not directly adding value 
Is that I how love you that. Yeah, yeah, totally. I absolutely love that. And yeah. I think once you have that map, you kind of take that extra, you take that extra step of, okay, how many resources am I putting in to yeah. get that value, right? Yeah. So for example, like we have something called QBRs, which is quarterly business reviews here in the customer success world, where uh-huh. we kind of review an account once a quarter with the account themselves, uh-huh. whether that's usage reports, data, you know, success plans, anything like that. Uh-huh. And what one client found was that, you know, sometimes some people don't put a lot of value into that, but it takes a ton of time to create and schedule meetings and have meetings and all this stuff. And what they realized was like, hey, we actually don't need to have this huge, huge process. We can derive the same amount of value with way less work, right? And it's optimizing kind of that value map so that your resource, it, you can maximize your your team's output as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I, that, that often is where... There, there's these epiphanies <laughs> where a company, you know, a company realizes they're doing something like, well, you know, we, we package it in this way and then we, you know, we send it out like this and, and we go through, we put it through this process. And the other one is like quality assurance. Like, oh, we, we do all this kind of quality assurance stuff. And well, does the customer really, does, does the customer benefit from quality assurance? They benefit from the quality. The quality assurance part is not as a non-value added activity, you know. So it's kind of figure out like how else can we make sure that quality is going to happen, and how can we re- and remove the time and remove the cost of this, you know. And, and really, like you, you get in there, and there's oftentimes people are like, "Well, I don't know why we're doing this." Like, the customer doesn't care. Why don't we change it? You know. So it's really kind of challenging, challenging those those assumptions. And I think it's, I think, I think there is a bit of a difference between you know, kind of startup world when you're kind of figuring these things out versus the you know established company you've been around for a while. You you have some quote unquote standard ways of doing things. They've worked well for you, you know, to a point. But if you're really going to focus on innovation and growth and improvement, oftentimes you really need to take a harder look at some of those steps. And this customer journey map uh, can be a great one because it's a great way to kind of frame it in terms of that customer value. So that's great. So in terms of other strategies, in terms of kind of designing uh, customer experiences or customer interactions, what are some of the other best practices that you've found or that you've either talked about in the book or you found inside the business that have helped you create kind of exceptional customer customer success, customer service? Yeah, great question. So I think, so I talked a little bit earlier about something called user complexity where you kind of understand the emotions behind, um, motion, the emotional complexity behind each of the users. And then there's also something called product complexity where okay. you look at the complexity behind the product. So is this something that is, requires this huge dashboard? You know, there's a million buttons, there's a million things that you could do and it's a super powerful tool. Or is it something, you know, very simple, has one function, does one thing really, really well, yeah. right? These two products have very different complexities and understanding where your own company falls on that spectrum is really important when it comes to designing a customer-centric process because and even a customer success function is that, you know, I can teach you the basics of, you know, what onboarding is and how do you engage users, how you prioritize your time, how you hire a team, like that's easy. But because it's not a copy paste sort of thing, you can't copy paste strategy along a bunch of different companies because every single company's one product is different and two users are different. Mm-hmm. When they're reading, for example, my book or any other blog, they need to understand also like product complexity as well as user complexity. And I kind of create this matrix within the book where, for example, if you have a service as you know really high product complexity uh-huh. and something that's really high in user complexity and that means that your service is something that you know maybe requires a lot of onboarding a lot of hand holding in the beginning because someone is not very familiar with the service or yeah. has never used it before or there's just a lot of the example i'd like to give yeah is Salesforce, you know, like, like there okay. are roles out there for just Salesforce, like just Salesforce. Industry because it's <laughs> We've had a couple of them on the podcast. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like there's, it's just such a behemoth of a product, yeah. right? And it's such a powerful tool, but it's like, it takes, it takes a really long time to really wrap your head around it. So something like Salesforce, an example of product complexity, right? This is a product that has, you know, just a lot of features, variables. There's a fairly steep learning curve to become proficient at the tool. That's product complexity. So explain user complexity then. Yeah. So user complexity is, you know, understanding where, one, why is the user coming to this product? And two, from what mindset is the user coming to this product? So for example, going along with Salesforce, you know, they have a, their people are dealing with a lot, a lot of customers, right? They're overwhelmed. They're super stressed. How, how do I 
grow and scale my business with so many customers that can barely keep track of in the Google spreadsheet, right? Yeah. And that's kind of what, one of the reasons why people go to Salesforce. And then, so understanding that kind of the pain and the anxiety and all those other emotions yeah. that the user has going in, I realized that, hey, because you have high user complexity and high product complexity, you actually have to, and I call it revolutionize as a function. So as a customer success function, as a so an example, so is a, a, a low customer complexity example, something like if I go, I, I need a haircut, you know, that's a low customer complexity versus if I'm, if I need a marriage counselor, uh, yeah. that's a high complexity, right? Like a haircut, it's, you know, I'm, I pretty much know how to purchase a haircut or I, I know what my variables are and I, it's pretty simple for me to choose versus marriage counselors. Like I, I kind of don't even know to start. I may not even know what my problems are. I, you know, I haven't, yeah. I, I, like I've, it's even confusing to understand what the criteria are. I should be using? Where do I find these people? Um, yeah. So, so that's user complexity versus the product complexity. Now, so you can get in situations where you have low user, low product and high user, high product. And then obviously the other combinations as well. Yes, exactly. And then basically when you look at customer success strategy or becoming more customer centric yeah. focused uh -huh. strategies, each of these things kind of plus nicely into a matrix. So if you have high user complexity, high product complexity, you have to kind of revolutionize. And what I mean by that is that, you know, this is going to be a really, it's going to be very, very complex. Your user has to make very significant changes to their day-to-day -day, day -day life to better understand how the two companies can work together, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's successful, you know, everyone's going to be super happy and super thankful. And if it fails, everyone's going to be like really sensitive to it. Yeah. yeah. So it's understanding how that works as well. And then, for example, if you have something that's like very low product complexity and very low user complexity, maybe your, your role is not necessarily, you shouldn't be trying to change your user's life. Like you have a very simple product and the people interacting with your product just you know, want one thing done, right? Yeah. It's very simple. They don't need some sort of like revolutionary like speech or motivational speech or anything like that. They want something very easy. So I call this simplify, right? Focus on getting the job done, understand what their pain point is and then get out of the way, you know, understanding yeah. where you, where you come in as a company in their lives. So the example that I think of, uh, and give me feedback on this, is um, it's a product example, not a service example, but uh, are these like super fancy corkscrews. And, <laughs> you know, and it's like, you know, you've got to plug them in and they, you know, they're the size of a coffee maker and, you know, but they take out the cork, you know, perfectly and stuff like versus just a simple waiter you know, key that, you know, is $4 at the store and does it just as well. It's kind of, for me, yeah. that's like, a, you know, the complexity, like it's pretty simple. My, the, the user level is simple and it seems like they've overcomplicated the, the solution to some extent. Um, <laughs> You know, I, exactly. I, but I think that happens all the time with services. You know, I think people, you know, design these kind of services and, and the delivery of these services uh, and they kind of over engineer them and overthink them thinking that it's going to add value or, you know, additional features or additional kind of perceived benefit is going to drive value for the customer. In the end, it just drives annoyance and it drives, you know, uh, yeah. it doesn't make it easier. It actually makes it worse for customers. Yeah, exactly. Like going back to your, you know, wine cover example, like if there was a bunch of little like buttons on the side, I'd be like really annoyed. I'd be like, what do these buttons do? Like, do I really need this extra? Like, why am I paying extra for this? It's actually giving me more, like more pause. Yeah. To deal with the company. Yeah. Not, not only does it cost more, <laughs> but it actually gives me anxiety. <laughs> like, well, now yeah. I'm going to figure out how to use this thing. You know, if I do it wrong, I ruin my wine. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. Don't, you never want to ruin your wine. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So this gives you this nice grid. And based on the quadrant that you're in, it gives you kind of a sense of, of what your customer strategy is going to be in terms of are you revolutionary, revolutionizing and are you really focusing on changing their, either the way they're doing things or their mental model or the, the frame of the world, or are you just trying to make it, you know, simple and easy and kind of conform to exactly what they're kind of doing now as easily as possible. That That's kind of exactly. my takeaway from the map. Yeah, boom, you got it. <laughs> okay. You know, another one I wanted to ask, and you know, this, this might be more kind of service focused, is oftentimes when we're doing kind of customer journey mappings is it, it often comes from kind of the sales starts with the sales process and people are trying to map out the sales funnel or map out the sales process. And we, you know, we talk about, okay, when did they first hear about you and know, awareness? And then we, you know, talk about first interaction and nurturing and then, you know, initial conversation and, you know, addressing needs and getting to some kind of sale. And, and typically those, those funnels end at uh, like signed contract or something like that. And, and one of my arguments is always, you know, that's really the midway point. <laughs> and, and, yes. and once you've got a signed yes. contract, you now you really need to think through, okay, well, what is, 
what does you know account setup look like? What does client engagement look like? What is the first delivery? How does that happen? What is the first six months of the relationship development? And and really, what our endpoint is is creating an advocate, creating uh, you know someone who's going to go out and represent our company to other companies uh, and actually refer us to other businesses. Uh, and I think people often kind of miss that, A, they miss that opportunity um, mm -hmm. to really think through how to kind of make the positive, but because they haven't mapped it out, they end up, you know, churning customers. They end up getting all these people, I think you mentioned it before, in the door or, you know, getting getting people kind of in the door, but then keeping them there is is half the battle. You know, it's like if you if you don't have a strategy for how you're going to keep people engaged, at a minimum, ideally making them advocates for the business, you're missing opportunities. I'm curious how you've yeah. addressed that or how you've thought about that. Yeah, you're actually missing a ton of opportunities. I mean, especially as more and more business models are going to the SaaS models, so subscription mm. models. Yeah. Um, renewals and upsells actually can account for 80% of revenue, especially wow. if you can keep someone over time. Yeah. Not only, there's like a multiplier effect, right? So yeah. if someone is really, really happy, not only are they your lifetime user, but they'll also be your lifetime advocate, exactly what you were saying. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of... Customer, the reason why customer success kind of was born was because a lot of companies are realizing that, hey, you know, let's care about users after they come in the door. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I'm only getting like 10% of what I could be getting if I don't care about them ever, like ever again. Because like, in the past, you know, like if you think about parents or grandparents' generations, they go to the store, they buy one thing, and then they never have to talk to the person ever again, right? Like. The, the, the product will speak for itself. But now, you know, like even looking at email, right? So every, I use email every single day. Like I need to be happy with email every every single month in order for me to renew my email subscription service or anything like or Netflix or whatever you want to put in there, right? And if I'm not happy anymore, I will just stop paying. Yeah. And that's, that's a huge revenue loss, right? The more people are dissatisfied, the less they'll come back, the less they'll tell their friends, the less, like there's so many... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I am, it's actually amazing how much revenue you could be losing if you don't keep that customer centric mindset post sale. Yeah, that's a great stat. I haven't heard that one, but eighty percent you that a good uh, you know good customer uh, kind of follow up uh, you know follow on you know services and upsell cross sell eighty percent of potential revenues. That's that's huge. Yeah, I mean, some people actually, some people say it's a, as low as like 70%, which is still a really high oh, number, yeah. <laughs> and as high as 8, 95%. So it's really insane, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's kind of finish with the conversation around um, if you are trying to create a culture inside your, your company that is more kind of customer success focused, uh, customer centric, what are some of the things you can do as a leader inside the business to, you know, inspire that, to fuel that process? Yeah, so I mean, it kind of all goes back to telling stories and then connecting with people emotionally, right? So as much as we are a business, if you don't, you have to go to the mindset of, hey, if you don't have customers, you don't have a business, right? So let me tell you how our customers are doing and how we can improve our customer experience. And that's kind of how I've approached this conversation with my own leadership, understanding like, hey, like, yes, you're getting a ton of sales, but you know how many of them are churning? You know how many of them have been complaining about our service in week one? Like yeah. that's actually a bigger problem than you not having enough leads, right? So let's make sure that we have someone who's dedicated to being an advocate for customers within the company, right? So like, for example, Bezos has this very famous um, story where he will leave a chair empty at every single board room meeting where, because that chair represents the customer. Ooh. Ooh, I like yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So it, it's kind of having that mindset of, yeah. you know, the customer is um, a huge stakeholder in every single strategy yeah. meeting. I've had a couple of clients where we'll do we'll do some like customer personas. We'll kind of we'll develop you know kind of a, a, a customer profile, a customer persona, um, and we'll actually make a cutout <laughs> of, of oh, that person awesome. and like put them put them in the chair. And uh, you know at the important meetings, it's like like literally you kind of turn to turn to to customer you know core customer persona. So how would this affect it? And even things like, I mean, the thing, you know, the things that are customer focused or customer facing, it's a little more, I think people tend to do a little bit better at, but even things like, you know, I've been in situations where, you know, companies are working on their like vacation policy and, and actually taking a moment to think about, okay, how is this going to impact the customer and say, all right, well, yeah, I get that, you know, we want to take uh, President's Day off or something, but you know, well, hmm, not all of our customers yeah. are going to President's Day off. Like we really need to, what are we going to do for them? Like, do we have a service? Are we getting a service? Are we going to rotate in? Someone's going to take 
take on the calls for that week. You know, it's it is it actually can affect every single part of your business if you set it up right to ask that question correctly. Exactly. Like for example, on our company, because we're an education ship education service, uh-huh. we go by the school year, right? Like so there's yeah. summer break, there's winter break, there's even ski break. Yeah. So understanding like how we can help them and cater to their customers in those moments um, is super important. Yeah. And meeting where they are. I mean it's certainly uh you know, you know, understanding their, you know, the week before a big vacation is not, they're not going to be super focused. <laughs> so let's not pretend that they might be. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah you got to be realistic throughout all of this as well. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to hit time here. Jennifer, this has been a pleasure. Great conversation. Um, you know, I love the insights that you have. I've loved the, you know, kind of the strategies that you've suggested. If people want to find out more about you and the the book, what's the best way to get that information? Yeah, the best way to, to get that information would be to go to my website, which is guide to customer success.com. And then there you can find more information about the book. You can also order the book, learn more about me, and I'll also have my contact information. And feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, I'm always happy to have these conversations about customer centricity and kind of being an advocate and empowering customer success. Perfect. I'll make sure that those links are all in the show notes so people can click through and, and get those. Jennifer, thank you so much for taking the time. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter. 